Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, December 20th. Wow, December 20th. Isn't that crazy? 2018, and this is the week in charts. Hmm. Obviously, I want to thank you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. And once again, I think the market remains the show. Jim can't hear me. Jim, turn your speakers up. Jim, turn your speakers up. <laughs> the sound's working, so Jim doesn't have his speakers on. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy Greg Morris, as I say quite often. Get a lot of good sayings out of Greg. If you haven't already done so, just real quick, and I'll put this up again, but there should be a banner ad on my website for this market timing course. A lot of things we'll talk about today come from that course, and I would recommend you take it. It is 100% free, and I think once you take it, you'll want to continue your education a little further into the member site. And if you want to just, if you don't see the banner ad on my site, if you're watching this a year from now, go to members and you'll be able to sign up to get that. Now for quite a while, I've been talking about winter is coming. For those of you who watch Game of Thrones, you know that bastard Jon Snow has been whining about winter for a long, long time. Well now I'm beginning to wonder if winter is here. So we're gonna take a look at those signals again. Couple things to know in a bear market. I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but I'm going to keep beating the dead horse until you people, not you people here today, but you people in general get it. It might die slowly as hope waxes and wanes, and that's kind of the kind of the situation we've been in, in up until somewhat recently, where you get these bounces and then it rolls back so over and it bounces again. And as I often say, if you go back several presentations, I talked about how it could be more of a process than an event. And as I've said quite a bit, that's one of the things I learned from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, and specifically Greg Morris, that bear markets, believe it or not, or tops, I should say, believe it or not, are often more of a process rather than an event which is kind of interesting because you think it's usually just the opposite. And bottoms often are an event. You think a top is a is a event because the media gets their panties in a wad and everybody gets all excited like, oh, God, you know, the sky is falling. And then – but what they don't realize is that rollover might have taken months. And in the case of now, if this truly is the beginning of something much bigger, which so far it sure looks like it could be, then it took – almost a year for this market to roll over. So a lot of times everybody gets excited when the market finally does drop. But a lot of times that, that top, again, not to beat the dead horse, but is a long time in the making. Now, what you have to realize is in general, all stocks will eventually and usually become victims. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of details and why it's dangerous to play the relative strength game. It's okay to go after something like IPOs and possibly some other super speculative issues because they can trade contra to the overall market. But I'm going to resurface the graphic or reshow the graphic from a few weeks back where I show the rats leaving the ship. Now, here's the deal. As a trend follower, we shouldn't care. Up, down, or sideways, right? We're going down, we'll get a short. Unfortunately, as I say, as I say quite often, the short side can suck because the retrace rallies can suck. Now, one way to play those retrace rallies is possible opening gap reversals, but that's a little bit more advanced technique, and that's not the easiest thing in the world. For those of you who are members of DaveLander.com, I did a presentation yesterday on that, and we talked about that in prior presentations. Look at the Q&A. It'll be posted later today. Now, in a bear market, more discretion is required. I think five out of the five last positions that I recommended really required quite a bit or a little bit at least of discretion to stick with them. So you will have to be willing to exercise a little bit of discretion. Now, I'm not saying throw caution to the wind, but what I'm saying is 
possibly give things a little bit more room around the stops. And again, you want to pick your spots super, super carefully. You're swimming against the tide, especially now that we have all these signals that have triggered. So make sure you have the mother of all setups on the long side. My problem is I'm under pressure to perform. So I feel like sometimes I have to produce something, but I have to weigh that against, do you really want to put capital in the harm's way? I certainly don't, and I would never recommend anything for you to do that I wouldn't do personally either exactly or something very, very similar, such as a similar stock, maybe even a more aggressive play within that particular sector. So if I'm not going to put money into harm's way, neither should you. And as I've said ad nauseum years ago, back when I was part of trading markets and they had salespeople, the salespeople used to call me up whining because I wasn't recommending any stocks. If I was recommending stocks and people were losing money, yeah, they'd lose a few clients, but not nearly as many clients as when I wouldn't recommend anything. So don't confuse lack of activity with not doing anything. A lot of times in markets, your best action, your best new action at least, is no new action. And as I often say, remember, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And again, here's another one of my beat a dead horse eggs. Bear markets are devastating. Whipsaws are frustrating. So if you say, you know what, I've had enough. This market's down over 10%. I'm following Dave's TFM system. I'm following weekly bow ties. I'm following even a death cross. <laughs> Never thought I'd say that. But even a death cross, and you say, you know, this thing looks like it's in trouble. I think I'm going to get out of the way. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. You might be aggravated. If the market begins to reverse today and goes on to make new highs and you're not on board, but you could eventually get back in. But if you lose 50% of your money by riding it all the way down or more, it's going to be very hard to recover from that. And unfortunately, as Tom McClellan and more specifically his mom said, his late mother Marion People buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And other you, others use methods that are far more sophisticated. Well, the needing money could come in the form of, you know, I'm getting ready to retire here. Damn it, I just lost half my retirement. I better get out before I lose another half of my retirement. So remember, people buy and sell for a variety of reasons. And your reason could be that you have to mitigate the losses, any further losses for retirement. Also, not to get too far into buy and hold, keep in mind that a market could go, can go 25 years or more without making new highs, as I often say, and borrowing again from Greg Morris, the buy and hold time horizons, and this is a big one here, the buy and hold time horizons are based on an 81 year period. And if you look at some of the presentations that I do, specifically when I talk about anti-buy and hold and market timing, quoting Sweet Brown, ain't nobody got time for that. Now, when it comes to a bear market or even a bull market, in any stock, commodity, cryptocurrency, bonds, the list goes on and on, there's going to be some sort of signal and more specifically a transitional pattern and a lot of the stuff I follow, and a lot of stuff I now follow that's similar to the stuff I follow. For instance, I'm going to show you a few things here with the 50-day moving average. Well, that in and of itself can help to keep you on the right side of the market and can also trigger major sell signals. So if we go to like a bow tie, now this chart's a little bit dated, but this is a daily Russell 2000. The Russell's a lot further down than it is now from when this signal triggered. So you can see, looking at the Rusty, we had this bow tie sell signal way up here in the mid 160s. And since then we had a pretty serious slide and taken one step further, that slide continues. All right, so let's take a look at some other major tops and bottoms, et cetera. So if we take a look at the S&P 500, way back in when? October, 
we had a bow tie set up and then trigger. And then obviously we're a lot further down from there. Now, this is a daily bow tie. And then again, look at market timing if you want to learn more about that and then go to methodology to learn more about bow ties. Now, as I often say, it's important to pay attention to major versus minor signals. And by the way, these indicators are free with the new meta stock. So we had a major sell. Well, Dave, what do you mean by a major sell? Well, a major sell is a transitional pattern that's coming off of multi-year highs or ideally all-time highs. So the most amount of people are going to be on the wrong side of the market at major, major new highs after, of course, the trend turns, or at the least they're going to have the wrong opinion about the market. So that could be pent-up selling, pent-up short selling, and on the buy side, just the opposite. You want to buy or pay attention, I should say. Now, this is a weekly S&P 500, by the way. But you want to pay attention when you get a weekly buy signal coming off of major, major lows. Now, obviously, we're not going to see, God, I hope not. I think we'll have bigger problems <laughs> than our trading accounts. But hopefully, we'll never, ever see all-time lows in the S&P 500 again. But a major buy, I would say, off of five, maybe 10-year lows or more. And I think the last major buy we had was off of 13-year lows, if memory serves. And then obviously back in 2007, early 2008, the signal began to trigger. And obviously, we all know what happened in 2008. And then after that, we had another major buy. The major buy was a little slow to catch up. The bow tie was a little sloppy. But there were plenty of other signals. There were daily bow ties. There were daily first thrusts. And there was actually a first thrust on a weekly chart back then and then we had a major sell because we were coming off all-time highs now that one didn't really pan out but if you were long stocks and you did not get out of the way and by get out of the way i don't mean you sell everything just because you have a sell signal but rather honor your stops and get taken out of your position then the market has rewarded your really bad behavior and then we had a minor buy because it wasn't coming off of major, major lows. And then now we're on the cusps of a major sell signal. Now, the bow ties have crossed over. But if you take a look at this ribbon down here, you can see that it's going to be bullish as long as what? The 10 is greater than the 20 and the 20 is greater than 30. The 20 and 30 are exponential. The 10 is just a simple moving average. I like the relationship, as I often say, between these three. And it wasn't the perfect tight bow tie, but you can see that they did come together and begin to spread out over several weeks because this is a weekly chart. And then now the 10 is less than the 20 and the 20 is less than the 30. So this is a bearish indicator, meaning that the trend according to this indicator is down. Now, technically for that bow tie to trigger, we'd actually have to have an up week followed by an entry. All right, let's talk about the TFM system, the 10% TFS, TFM system update. So I set out to create a simple little system and without going into a lot of details, the point is that if a market's gonna go from A to B to C, it's gonna have to pass through B along the way. And if it's gonna go from A to B to C on the downside, it's gonna have to cross back through. So in other words, it's basically what technical analysis is completely based on. So if a market's at A and it's going to C and B is somewhere in between, okay, then obviously it's going to have to pass through B along the way. Now, if it's going to go beyond C, not to be confused with beyond C, then as long as the market is at or near C, what I'm saying is stay long. Now, if it's going to go back down to A, OK, if it drops below a certain level below C, then maybe it's on its way back to B and then ultimately on its way back to A. OK, so this is technical analysis 101. It's why technical analysis works. It's a hard and fast rule. Technical analysis also works because of the psychology of the market's participants. Don't confuse the issue with facts is what I often say. But notice that we were more than 10% away here 
from the highs, okay? And we also closed below the 50-week moving average. Now, those are, and again, the, uh, the idea is not to teach you the whole system and everything because that's just go get the market timing course for free, and it's all in there, spelled out. But I just want to kind of gloss over, not gloss over, but just kind of give you a thumbnail sketch of how this works. And the close below the 50-week moving average is just simply a whipsaw filter to help you from too much buying and selling. Now, as I often say and I've said before, the problem with whipsaw filters is if you put too many of them in, then you might end up getting into the trend really, really late, or you might end up chasing your own tail, and then you could end up trying to curve fit something. So keep your whipsaw filters very, very, very simple if you're designing a system. So we are bullish as long as we have Dave light to the upside, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. In this case, we're using a weekly chart and a 50-week moving average, and you're within 10% of the market all-time highs. But you can see when we go greater then 10% away from all-time highs, or in this case, I think it's set to 250-day highs, which is roughly one year's worth of trading. And you get a close below the 50-week moving average. Then that is a sell signal. Now, let's zoom in a little bit see where we are. You can see that we did have a sell signal a few weeks back. And notice in the ribbon down here, we were at neutral because... Price was intersecting the, the 50 week moving average. Okay. And you're bullish when it's not intersecting the 50 week moving average and it's less than 10% away from new highs. And you can see that it did turn bearish quickly, went back to neutral, and now we're bearish again. But that signal remains in effect until and unless we get a buy signal. So if we zoom in a little bit more, you can see that we did go greater than 10% away from that high, and then there was downside Dave light, okay? And then obviously we're a little bit lower than we were in this particular chart, but the signal remains in effect until we get an opposing signal. Now, as I preach, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. So if a market is to begin to trend lower, you're going to get some downside Dave light. Now, I updated this chart, you could see when you have upside Dave light going back to the mid 90s, for the most part, the market heads higher. And then when you have downside Dave light, the market heads lower. Upside Dave light higher, downside Dave light lower. And again, we're just using a 50 week moving average. And we're just looking for highs below that moving average for downside Dave light. You might hear me drop an F bomb here. <laughs> Oh, man. The show, the show mucks me up. I had to put some trades on to do the show. Sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes it keeps me from uh, messing up. But anyway, you can see we did have a little downside Dave Light in 2011, 2012. But for the most part, it was green ever since. And then we obviously that 2015, 2016 slide, which doesn't look that like that big of a deal on this particular chart, but it's actually it was a pretty big deal. Like I said, if you just blindly held on through that, it was probably a bad thing to do. And again, the last little run we had, we had upside daylight or Dave light. And then now you have to squint your eyes to see it. And I'll zoom it in for you. But now we're beginning to get some downside Dave light. So if I zoom it in a little bit, you can see back here, the lows are greater than that 50 week moving average. Right here, they intersect. So the reading is zero. And, and as I've said quite a bit, this just counts the number of days. So each day it stays above the moving average. This bar is going to get bigger by one bar. So we had 25 weeks coming into this little slide. We go back to zero. We had one week. And then now since October 19th, we haven't had any upside Dave light. And now you can see we've had a couple of weeks of downside Dave light. So again, one day here below. So that's minus one back up to it, resets to zero, one day down, that's minus one, one day down, now that's minus two. Now, it's been a few weeks since I've 
done a chart show. And if you go back to those, I said, well, what's going to happen is we have the drop off effect, which is bringing that 50 day moving average down quickly towards the 200 day moving average. So we'd probably get a death cross whether or not the market slid, but the market obviously did slide. And so what happens is that we started adding in prices down here, low prices. And I don't know exactly where 50 is. Let's see, 5, 10, 50, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. So somewhere in here. So maybe here we're taking these off and adding these in. So this angle is beginning to drop very hard and fast. Now, as I preach, the death cross in and of itself isn't a big deal. But what can happen after the death cross can be a pretty big deal. So I'm a big fan of my bow ties. And then I realized that a 50 week moving average could actually do a pretty dang good job of keeping on the right side of the market. But if you wanted to use something like the death cross, that's fine. You're gonna find that when you're using a trend type of indicator, they're all gonna begin to sort of look the same, even though I'm really proud of some of the things I've developed over the last 20, 30 years. A lot of these ind indicators are going to look the same. And as I often say, everything works better with trend. But before I digress too far, you can see we had some pretty serious slides on a couple of these death crosses, especially when they're coming off of all-time highs. And then the last one wasn't that big of a deal. But again, that was a little uglier than you would think or than it looks. In fact, what I wanted to show you here is just like the, I've been saying quite often, the weekly bow tie in the Russell 2000, it dropped 18%. Well, I think it dropped like 16 or 17% from this death cross that we had last time in 2016. So that's nothing to sneeze at. That's a pretty serious slide. I can't imagine that stocks in general, that if you had stocks in general in portfolio, that you would be able to survive such a slide. Now, one thing I want to point out and I want to jump into charts just for a second, come back to the slides, finish up, and then we'll go back to the charts and open it up for questions. But I talked about this slide a few weeks back. This goes back to a presentation I did many years ago, maybe in 2014 or 13, the last time the market looked a little iffy. And what happens is your momentum stocks get whacked pretty hard. This is like a little rat leaving a ship, right? So... The name of this ship, in case you're wondering, is SS Sheep Dip. So the point I'm making is all stocks eventually go down. Now, you might be saying, well, Dave, why are you trading some of these super speculative issues and IPOs when they're all going to go down? It's like, well, it's the only game in town. And these stocks can trade contrary to the overall market because they're higher in volatility. And these big cap and defensive issues up here or lower in volatility, and, and to me, it's just not worth going after them. So this is a little bit of a last gasp, last ditch effort to go after these IPOs and super speculative issues. But here's the deal. I'm seeing fewer and fewer of them now, so that game could be over. I stopped out of one yesterday. I stopped out of one today. I stopped out of a couple of them while I was on almost said vacation, but it was a working vacation while I was at Charles Kirk's retreat. So my portfolio is getting cleaned out pretty quickly on those issues. And in some cases, I was able to get a nice little pop out, a little swing trade out, and I'm kind of scratching out now on those. So it was worth a shot. I mean, we get paid to put money, to put capital in the harm's way. Now, let me just shift gears for a second, and let's – see if I could get this screen shared. And I want to show you why I don't necessarily play the relative strength game. So if we take a look at the major MIGs, and again, I'm going to come back to the market in just one second, and we can open it up for, uh, we'll open it up for individual stock picks. In fact, let's do that now, and then I'll come back to them after I finish my slides. But if we take a look at the major MIGs, which are Morningstar industry groups, and if we did add something in like the Death Cross, okay, and start looking at these, 
you could see that most are in pretty serious slides. Most have death cross to the downside. This is a bummer because energies are sometimes an area you can go after because they trade contracts in the market. Ditto for metals and mining, but you see it looking pretty bad in here. And the point I want to get to after we kind of go through a few of these areas is, and here's a good example, this is why you don't want to play the relative strength game. Consumer non-durables, people still need toilet paper, right? In a bear market, okay? So this is why you might think, well, let's just, you know, let's go to these so-called defensive issues. But the bigger they are, sometimes the harder they fall. And let's take a look at real estate's another good example. This is one of the few areas that was still doing fairly well up until recently, but then it came right back in. Now, with something like real estate, it's such it's so low in volatility, it's not worth going after. Utilities would be the same sort of thing. It's just you're really not going to make a whole lot of money. And then guess what? They still can have pretty serious slides. So this is a pretty serious slide of utility. So you think you're kind of escaping the sinking ship by running up to the bow and getting those defensive issues. And the reality is you could actually get into a lot of trouble and doing that. There's health services, as you can see, imploding in here. And the list goes on and on. Okay. Let me pop back to the slides just for a second, finish up. And then now I left some of these in from last week or two or three weeks ago, whenever I did the show. By the way, no show next week because we're in between Christmas and New Year's and I'm going to take a break. It's just, uh, it's thin and choppy trading then anyway. And it's a shortened week. I've seen a lot of bottom picking at a top. Now, Dave, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me just show you real quick. So a lot of times when a market is at a top, you'll get a lot of picking bottoms at tops. So what I'm trying to say there, and thanks for your patience, is let's say you have a market that looks like this, goes down and down and down for months, 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 maybe even years, okay? And you get a bow tie or something down here, cup and handle, first thrust, pick your favorite transitional pattern. Well, that's okay, all right? That's a different type of signal. What concerns me is when you have a market rolling over like this, and you get like a little blip up, well, the whole world thinks, oh, okay, well, it's going to go straight back up. It's like, well, it might, but the odds are against you if you're already in a bona fide rollover. For me to pick a bottom in this market, it would have to drop for a long, long, long time, or it would actually have to go back to new highs, okay, for me to get excited about it. So I would let things pan out. And it's just not over. It ain't over till it's over, right? The other thing, obviously, you want to remain cautious. I would urge you to don't feel any anxiety or FOMO, the fear of missing out. So what if you miss that first push higher when we hit the bottom? It's just not worth going after. Now, I'm not talking about it's okay to play like an opening gap reversal or something. If we come in and we get a big washout at these low levels, then by all means, if you're a little bit more disciplined, then feel free to step in and play an opening gap reversal. The other thing I would encourage you to do is stay setup driven. Now, my Landry list, I think it was two days ago, my Landry list is a list of stocks that I'm watching that I published in the service. In the history of the last 20-something years, I can never remember not having at least a few stocks to publish and I didn't have any stocks after going through a couple thousand of them that I thought were worth going after. So I would remain very cautious. I would remain very selective and remain setup driven. If I see the mother of all setups, then I'm going to take it. Anything less, I'm going to sit on my hands. So again, as I said a minute ago, make sure you take the free market timing course if you don't see this banner out on the website, just click on members and sign up there and members would be right here on the website. Now, as I've been saying quite a bit, the membership, it's really helping those who truly want to be helped. And a lot of people, they just dabble in trading and they just waste their hard earned cash, rinse and repeat, and they're not willing to invest in themselves. 
And it's a shame because I see a lot of people lose a lot of money. But I think if you really want to learn how to trade, I think you can. The tools are there. And but you, you're gonna need a little put a, you're gonna have to put a little skin into the game. And even those who really want to learn, what I found over the years is they seem to be missing a lot of pieces that I just assumed that they already had, such as money management, some simple things about the methodology, et cetera. So it's all in here. And then we can track your course progress, figure out where you are, and keep on going from there. And as I often use the example, sometimes people are having trouble setting stops or they're not taking profits properly or trailing stops properly. Well, if I go in and look and see that they haven't bothered to finish the money management, I shouldn't say it like that. If they haven't had a chance to finish the money management, if they truly want to learn, then I would suggest maybe tapping the brakes a little bit on the trading and go back in and finish the money management. Same thing goes for some psychological problems, some psychological errors. Go in and finish the trading psychology and the mindset. So anyway, this is the members page. Obviously, you can click on members on the front and you can get started for free with, with some things. I tease you a little bit, but you're not going to have access, unfortunately. Unfortunately, having a look at it <laughs> to the uh, unfortunately to these members courses down here, but some pieces of these will be unlocked in the under free stuff once you get in. So start for free and then work your way up. All right, let's go ahead and open it up to individual stock questions. Let's take a look at the overall market. When I came in this morning, I was hoping that, especially given yesterday's action, I was hoping that we would get a big gap lower, followed by a nice intraday reversal. Unfortunately, we got a little bit of that today, and then the market came right back in. So that's a bit of a bummer there. So far, the trend obviously remains down. One thing I often like to do is draw a trend line through as many bars as you can intersect, and you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is pretty ugly in here. Maybe tomorrow we'll finally get that opening gap reversal that we so desire. If you get a chance, and it should be published by the time I get this published on YouTube, watch this on YouTube, go in and watch the presentation I did yesterday on opening gap reversals in the members area under the Q&A. And one thing that's been a little tougher that I said is, for instance, like this is a really nice opening gap reversal. I do remember playing that one. And this move here, this huge move down, that's what I was looking for. But that didn't come until a day later, and that was after I exited this position on the close. I like to close out those opening gap reversal plays by the end of the day. So that scores as a bummer. So the point I'm making is it hasn't been cut and dry. It hasn't been super easy to play these opening gap reversals. It's been a little bit tough, quite frankly. But now that we're banging out brand new lows in the P's, maybe we'll get one of those opening gap reversals. Now, here's a little perspective. This is something I've been reluctant to do just because it's scary, where could this market go? Well, I hate to make any predictions, okay, because I'm a trend follower. But let's take a look at that. Let's switch back to the P's. In the S&P 500, if this thing continues to crack, we could easily have a handle, let's see, maybe 2,200 or so, 2,100. We could easily have a handle down in the 2,100s which will put us all the way back to 2015, 2016. You pilots in here don't interject, but as I often preach, they slide faster than they glide once they begin to fall over. That's not contradicting my top as a process, because look at this, it's taken a whole year for this market to top, but now that it has topped, look what's happening. It's getting to slide in earnest, and again, people are selling stocks for a variety of reasons which have nothing to do with the economy or the Twitter in chief or any of that other stuff out there. Take a look at NASDAQ, 5,000 could be the next stop in the NASDAQ. I'm not predicting that. I'm just telling you where I see the next level of support. Russell 2000, the ugliest of them all. Back that chart way out. And it's actually almost all the way down to support around 120 or so in here. So that's been a pretty ugly slide. 
all of these indices, if you take a look at a weekly, again, I showed you a couple earlier, but look how clean that weekly bow tie is there, which is pretty ugly. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? Take a look at the NASDAQ. Not a perfect crossing, but it did cross tight enough to make it a weekly bow tie. And same thing applies to the P's. Not super tight, but let's say one, two, three. As long as it happens within three or four bars, I consider that a, a decent bow tie. Maybe a little bit more lenient here and there, but you get the idea. It's now in downtrend proper order. You know, maybe this afternoon we have the mother of all reversals and we're done. But as a trend follower, I do not try to predict the end of the trend. Now, I will, okay, in a case like back here and back here, if I do have buy signals coming, especially coming off of multi-year lows, then, yeah, I'll step up and begin buying. And as I often say, or I said a few minutes ago, it's setup driven too. I'll start seeing a lot of buy setups and I'll start taking some buy setups and go from there. Okay. Individual stock picks, WWE. And you want to short it. Okay. Well, on the short side, let's see if I could draw on this actual chart. On the short side, what I like to see is let's say you got a market headed higher like this, begins to roll over. I like taking that first little blip up, okay? So in this particular case, this is a little bit in hindsight, you can see you did have a thrust down here and you had a little bit of a pullback. So that would have been the first thrust. And then again, you had this one here and then you had that pullback, okay? So that's another case where it would have been obviously a little bit more obvious on the short side. This was in those recent Landry list. But now, if we zoom in a little bit on this chart, well, let's just leave it where it is for now. Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, yeah, you had the thrust down, especially if you go from here all the way to here. But then what have you had? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty four. So you have about two or at least one month worth of trading where it traded higher, then now it's kind of bumping around. Okay. So, does this look like a stock that's still in trouble? Yes. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Would I short it? And the answer is no. I think good eye in catching this, but your opportunity would have been like here and then here, and then now it's just bouncing around. My pullback scan, I think is set for about eight days. So this would no longer come up as a pullback. And the other thing that I could throw out on the short side, especially, but on a long side in a transitional setup too. So it, transitional setups in general, you want to see them go after one or two bars ideally and then a few bars max. At least that's your best setups. Now, I will look to get in maybe six or seven bars down the road, six to seven bars in the pullback. But your big opportunity is going to be when they trigger after just a few days of pulling back because that – traps the most people on the wrong side of the market okay and remember as i preach everything i do is has a psychological back okay so i would hold off on that one chris for now okay any more got a quiet bunch today i think everybody's out doing their shopping huh let's see if i can find an example of a something that no this isn't a really that a great example it did trigger after a few days of pulling back, but your best setups are going to trigger after, again, just a day or two of pulling back. All right, any more? Quiet bunch once again. All right. Let me just give it one more minute. Going once, going twice. Any questions in general? All right. Well, TLT, here we go. I always get somebody at the last minute all the time. All right. Well, this is going to be a very efficient issue. Your HV is eight, okay? And it just doesn't have a lot of structure to it. Now, what did I say earlier? I said every major bear market will have some sort of transitional setups. So I guess we're still in this top that we saw a long time ago there. Shorter term, yeah, it's headed higher. But I don't see any reason to rush out and buy this at this juncture 
And as a general statement, you're not going to really make much money trading an ETF like TLT. There's some other uh, ETFs that you might be able to hold on to that are a little bit more volatile if you've got some sort of major signal in place. But as a general statement, it's going to be hard to make much money in something like the TLT. All right, any more? And also, there's no structure here. I mean, this yeah, it's had a nice run higher. But for me, it would have to break out of this level here, and then you're in a big, fat wad of overhead supply. So you'd be better off being a stock picker, I think. Okay. All right. Well, Merry Christmas to you, Christopher, and to anybody else here that celebrates. Merry Christmas. Everyone else, uh, I don't think we'll see you guys again until next year since I'm taking the week of charts off next week. So everybody have a great New Year's, and then we'll see you early next year. Thank you guys and girls so much.